That means it's good to go. Good to go. Okay. All right, now, uh, we've defined some of the terms that are going to be applicable for our entire discussion here once we get into the uh, matters of textual criticism. And I want to begin by looking at the Old Testament. We'll spend most of our time looking at the New Testament theories, but we have to consider where the Old Testament fits in here uh, as well. Now, before I do that, let me make sure that we all know the one basic assignment. This class is basically a seminar class. It's going to just be a pass-fail uh, operation. The only assignment you have is to read, uh, read Bergen's uh, Revision Revised and um, write a report, a review. Did I tell you how many pages? What did I say? Five to eight. Five, to eight. Five preferably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so read it carefully. Be able to write a book report and a review. All right. I want more than just a book report. Uh, you know the difference between a book report and a review, all right? Uh, so you have to deal with the content, but just give me your assessment of it. I think there are many arguments in Bergen that have yet to be uh, answered. Bergen in his day was very often dismissed. Uh, the little statement that you often hear regarding Bergen, it, he was a champion of lost causes. Uh, and I suppose in some ways uh, he was. He was an Anglican, all right? He was Anglican. Uh, I know that Westcott and Hort are generally uh, dismissed by those that hold to the received text because they were Anglican, right? Uh, and had, but Bergen was also, right? So you end up with the same. You can't pick and choose. Uh, that becomes irrelevant in regard to the issue. But I think there are some uh, some issues that Bergen has addressed uh, that have yet to be answered, that have been ignored, uh, and it really is a uh, it's a standard work. Uh, in this field. So read it, you need to be familiar with it and write the review and then that'll be that'll be it. All right now uh, let me say some things here broadly about the Old Testament uh, and the transmission of the Old Testament and how we deal with textual matters there and then we'll I say apply most of our attention to the New Testament. Now when we come to the Old Testament we have, we'll start down here, what we refer to as the Masoretic text. All right, the Masoretic text. The Masoretes, the Masoretes were Jewish scribes in the post Christian era. All right, the Masoretes, the work of the Masoretes, we date to 5th, 6th centuries AD. They were scribes, and they were responsible, among other things, for establishing a text, dealing with a text, the Masoretic text. Yeah. Also involved with the vocalization, the vowel pointings that uh, you're familiar with in the Hebrew text. We'll talk about that here in just a moment. But this is what we have. All right, when you open up your Greek or, or, or your Hebrew Bible, you have a Masoretic text. You have a single manuscript, all right? You have a single manuscript, and this is one of the unique uh, differences between the Old Testament editions that you have and the New Testament editions that you have. Uh, you have in the Old Testament a single manuscript. If you're using the Stuttgart edition, Leningrad B19A, uh, one manuscript. And then you have the apparatus. If you have a critical text, you have the apparatus there that will show you various uh, readings, variants, even between some Masoretic texts. But the differences are so slight, and we'll see why here in just a moment, that we can get away, if I can put it in those terms, we can get away with simply having a single a single manuscript. Now the question then, here's what we have. And there's the original, there's the autographer, 
All right, there's the autographer. Uh, the actual documents, right, as we define the autographer, the actual documents that Moses wrote, Isaiah wrote, what have you, we don't possess those. We don't possess those. This is what we possess. All right, this is what we possess. Now the question is, how do we get from there to here? All right, how do we get from there to here? And uh, there was a historic process. All right, there was now a historic process. Again, we want to factor in uh, our presupposition that what God has inspired, God is going to preserve. How has he preserved it? How has he preserved it? Preservation being the ordinary work. Uh, of God. How has he preserved uh, that text? And we can look historically then at the means by which that text uh, was uh, was transmitted. They began to be copied, right? They began to be copied. And we talked about the copying process, right? And they're going to be in the copying process. Uh, stuff Stuff's going to happen, right? Stuff is going to happen. Stuff's going to happen in terms of sight. Stuff is going to happen in terms of hearing, depending upon whether that manuscript was copied tit for tat. You know, I'm looking here, I write it here, I look here, I write here. Uh, stuff's going to happen. And you have various types of manuscript error. We talk about dittography, writing something twice that should be written once. Haplography, writing something once and leaving something out uh, in, in the process. Uh, because of something with a similar ending or whatever, and th I, I say things happen. Uh, it, it's a different, you know, world today. When I was when, when I was uh, in school, uh, no such thing as computers. All right, no such thing as computers. Uh, had typewriters. Had these things called typewriters, and I had to write my papers as a student. Turn them in typewritten. I was not a good typist, so I married my wife, who was a extremely good typist, to get me through school. Right, uh, other reasons, but she was a remarkably good typist, and I wrote all my papers out longhand. All right, I wrote all my papers out longhand. I would give that paper to my wife, and then she would type it according to uh, our f stylus back then was Campbell instead of Turabian, but similar. She would type it according to that standard and then I would proofread the paper and turn that paper in and get my typical A, right? That's what it would, uh, what, what would happen. I did my dissertation, all right? My dissertation I wrote longhand uh, and gave it to her and she typed it. I, we had a Hebrew typewriter that we could use um, to put the, the Hebrew stuff in. Now, uh, in that process, in that process, she would, from the copy that I gave her, she would type out my paper. I would proofread that paper. I always proofread my stuff, which I recommend to students as well that they don't seem to do anymore. Uh, but I would proofread my paper. And in proofreading my paper, I would look at that and I would say, something, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Something is missing. All right, something is missing. So I would look at the original that I gave her and compare it to the type copy that, and sometimes whole paragraphs would be missing. And I say, what did you do? And sure enough, you know, she, she's not reading. She's got this ability to look there and just type and look and type and look and type. And as she's looking back, she sees this word, right? Type that. She looks back, she sees that same word down maybe eight or nine lines. Uh, and so her eye catches that, and she starts typing there and leaves out everything in between. Uh, now, why did she do that? Did she do that because she hated me? <laughs> no, don't think so. Did she do that because she was trying to get me to get my first A- in, uh, in, in grad school? No, I don't think so. Th that's... Haplography, all right. She saw something, and something was left, left out. Did do it on purpose, but she created a variant, all right. But I knew I could go back to the original and then make the, make the corrections, and that stuff happened. I say, in the copying process, uh, sometimes by sight, sometimes by ear, depending upon stuff, happened. Stuff happened, and we can look then at the whole history 
of the development then of that text as this text began to uh, this text began to be transmitted uh, historically we talk sometimes about a proto masoretic text this only exists in our imagination as it were all right but a proto masoretic text that ultimately leads here and we have what we often refer to as a proto-Septuagint text that ultimately led down to the Septuagint. This would be Hebrew. This only exists in our imagination, you see. But, and even some would argue here for a proto-Samaritan Pentateuch. Now, we know that the Samaritan Pentateuch, I, I placed little stock. Right, I placed little stock in the Samaritan Pentateuch for textual purposes because I can argue very strongly that the Samaritan Pentateuch had a theological agenda. All right, They had a theological agenda. You know the Samaritans, right? Those that were uh, in northern Israel after the captivity and became a... So for textual, many of the variants there we can immediately cross out as being uh, theologically uh, motivator. So I don't put a lot of stock there. But because all of the evidence that we have for the for the Hebrew text is in the Masoretic tradition, the, in Old Testament textual criticism, the Septuagint is going to be very important information. It's a version. Or it is a version. And that versional evidence is going to have significant uh, input in my understanding of that of that Hebrew text. Now, from this proto-Masoretic text, then that develops, right? You have various, what seem to be regional manuscripts. Here's where the Qumran evidence is so remarkably uh, important for us, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, most of the Masoretic manuscripts, all the Masoretic manuscripts, first of all, are post-Christian. All right? They're post-Christian. The oldest extant, the oldest extant uh, Hebrew manuscript, Masoretic manuscript, uh, is, is 10th century, right? 10th century A.D. This is why Qumran was so remarkably significant. With Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls. We had discovered, right, in that, you know, the whole story there, this 47, 1947 discovered, this whole cache, this whole cache of Hebrew manuscripts. Hebrew manuscripts, sometimes complete Old Testament books, all of Isaiah, the Isaiah scroll, another Isaiah scroll, Habakkuk commentary, Various, virtually every book of the Old Testament represented, except I think Esther. You see, uh, and what what does that say about what is, the fact that Esther? We pause here just for a moment. The fact that Esther was not found among the Qumran documents says what about their view of Esther? Nothing, right? Nothing. Exactly. You don't argue from silence. The fact that we don't have Esther from Qumran only means one thing. We don't have Esther from Qumran. Right? It wasn't discovered. Uh, so don't make any conclusions on the basis of that negative evidence. But I say Qumran because now with Qumran and the Qumran documents, some of them date into 150, the Isaiah scroll, we date to 150 B.C. Wow. We have now a manuscript a thousand years earlier. We have Hebrew manuscripts. The actual documents, manuscripts, actual documents. We have Hebrew manuscripts now, a thousand years earlier than the oldest extant Hebrew man. That had to be exciting, all right? Now, if that happens, what, what's my what, what's the first thing I want to do as a scholar? Compare it. Compare it. All right, that's the first thing I want to do, and they did. And remarkably, remarkably, the evidence is that what we see in the Qumran evidence is very much the same as what we have in the Masoretic text. All right, so that's extremely important piece of evidence. Sometimes there are places where it conforms with the Septuagint, but for the most part, it's going to agree with the Masoretic uh, tradition. 
But about AD 100, about AD 100, we have the standardization of the Hebrew text. Rabbi Akaba right, is associated uh, with this. Uh, and with the standardization of the text, now some very rigid, some very rigid uh, policies, if you will, or practices were implemented in terms of the copying of those texts after that point. Now, this happened, I say, in AD 100, and most likely, most likely involved with the Christian use of the Septuagint. The Septuagint was of what? Jewish origin, right? The Septuagint was of Jewish origin. But now here are these Christians. Here are these Christians and they are using the Septuagint as their principal Bible to prove that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. And so using a Jewish document, Septuagint, to prove that Jesus of Nazareth is a is the long promised Messiah, the Jews are getting upset. You can't do that, sir. And so they standardize the text in such a way. Say, well, this Septuagint doesn't come from this; it comes from something else. You see, undermining something of the authority uh, of the Septuagint. Uh, but once this text was standardized, now we're only talking about the consonants, right? I'm talking about the standardization of the consonantal text. There was no vowels incorporated yet into the uh, Hebrew orthography. Now, the Hebrew had vowels. Obviously, you can't talk without vowels. But as far as the orthography was concerned, there were no, uh, there were no vowel systems. But the text was standardized. And once the text was standardized, the Jewish people became very, very rigid, became very, very rigid in how that text was copied. Words were counted to make sure that the next person that copied had the same amount of words. Uh, you, you have incorporated what's called the Masora, ultimately, uh, which will identify how many words, how many letters, what's the middle word, what's the middle letter. You copy this, you make sure that it's got that many words, that many letters, and so forth. See? And they could, at that point, they couldn't, they could not, they, they could not uh, touch, they couldn't touch uh, the text. All right. Now they had ways around it. They had ways around it. If they wanted to exercise some degree of textual criticism, they had ways of, of, of doing it without altering uh, the text. You have your, I'm not going to go through all this, but remember in your introduction, uh, the Tekin Soferim, right? 18 different readings. When the masters, or not the, the scribes rather, uh, they had some particular problem, and so they wanted to make the change, but they couldn't change the text, so they had little ways around it. Uh, for instance, one, one of the famous ones here, uh, there in Judges, in Judges where it talks about the renegade priest, right? The renegade priest, uh, and it's Gershom, uh, the son of Moses. Son of Moses. If you look at your English Bible, it's the son of Manasseh. All right, it's the son of Manasseh. So the scribes come to this and they say, oh, Here's this renegade priest. We can't have him being Gershom, the son of Moses. All right? He can't be. So instead of putting Moses, now they couldn't change the text. There's Moses. All right? There's Moses. But they put a noon right up there. This is called the suspended noon. Remember that? The suspended noon. So don't read Moses. Read Manasseh. All right? Read Manasseh. And it comes out in most of our English Bibles as Manasseh taking that. But that was intentional, all right, to preserve the reputation of, of Moses. I remember I asked a student one time to discuss for me the suspended noon. And he gave me, wrote me a paragraph on Joshua's long day, right? <laughs> uh, Makes you wonder sometimes, all right, about students. But so then change the text, but they'll play little tricks like that at times, all right, to, but we can tell that was intentional, all right, we can tell that was 
intentional. And then with that standards I text, you had various uh, various attempts now to uh, put vocalization, the Naphtali's and the Asher's, and finally the Ben Asher family uh, led to a vocalization system that brings us to the Masoretic text. But why is it? All right, why is it that we don't have a lot of Hebrew documentation here? I say thanks to Qumran. Thanks to Qumran, we have uh, we have manuscripts that are a thousand years earlier. But how come in in the in, in this period? In that thousand year period, we don't have a bunch of Hebrew manuscripts. Yeah? Uh, what happened to them? Uh, well, what do you do? What do you do with an old Bible? You have old Bibles? What do you do with an old Bible? It's all worn out. It's all worn out. What do you do with it? You know, I have a hard time throwing a Bible in a trash can. Don't you? I have a hard time putting a Bible in a trash can. So you stick it in a drawer. I've got drawers around my house. You pull out their Bibles there that go back. Who knows when? I have in my office still my first. I, I've got my first Schofield reference Bible. All right. Uh, I got it when I was 12 years old. I got it when I was 12 years old. Getting your first, in, in the tradition that I grew up in, getting your first Schofield reference Bible was kind of like Jewish bar mitzvah, right? Uh, you've reached adulthood, and you get your first Schofield Bible, and I and I still have that Bible. And you look at it, and there's names in there of old girlfriends, right, that are crossed <laughs> out. That it brings back, it brings back such memories. Uh, how do I get on that? What do you, What do you do with old Bibles? Right? What, what do you? What do they do with old scrolls? Right? Scrolls wore out, and it was the Jewish tradition. All right, when a scroll began to wear out for whatever reason, that scroll would be placed in what was called the Geniza of the synagogue. The Geniza. The Geniza was a storeroom uh, in the synagogue. These old scrolls would be housed there for a while, and when they got enough of them, they'd have a ceremonial burning. They burned their old scrolls, all right? Out of not out of out of reverence. Right? This is their way of expressing reverence. Here's a scroll. Here's God's word now that is, that is frayed and is coming apart. And we'll, we'll keep it, and then you have this ceremonial burning. So on purpose, all right. On purpose in the Jewish tradition, these old scrolls were destroyed out of reverence because you don't want to see God's word hanging around there with wormholes in it, and you know. So you destroy it, burning. So we don't have those. We don't have, so that's why I say Qumran was so very, very significant. So what happened here? But when we compare that, you know, so we, knowing what the, the tradition was here with this standardized text, and the work of the following scribes and the, and the mass reads particularly created this system, very much superstitious in some ways, all right, to ensure that the next copy was going to be precisely the same as what it was copied from. How many words? So you count, make sure you've got that many words. What's the middle word? Make sure that's your middle word. If it's not, then start over and find out where, you know, what's missing. What's the middle letter? Some very detailed uh, data there to ensure that the next copy. Now I say some of that was superstitious, but, I, but at the same time I say, hey, this is good for us. This is a, a, a good thing for us as text for critics that look at that and we can be, that's why then we can come to the Hebrew edition and give you one manuscript, all right? We can give you one because of the way in which it was so tediously and precisely and uh, with all of these checks and balances to make sure that collating, ma collating Masoretic manuscripts is basically, you know, futile. All, so much of it the same. But there are differences. There are still variants. So you see that in your apparatus, but very, very, uh, very, very much in the minority. The Septuagint, uh, the Septuagint evidence. Uh, is going to be important. But we come to, how did I do that? You hit that up here? Did you see that? Did you see that? All of that stuff. And you were just watching me do that when you knew I could hit that little thing up there. Uh, Septuagint. Now, I, I, I compare, here's my Masoretic text. All right? I'm using MT here for Masoretic text, not majority text. There's the Masoretic text, and I compare that now with the Septuagint. This is Hebrew, and this is Greek. And I can compare the Septuagint with the Masoretic text, but I'm comparing two different languages. 
So if I'm going to use the Septuagint in textual criticism, it's part of the versional evidence and it's going to be an important witness. What do I have to be able to do? I can't comp compare in this to that. doesn't make any difference. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, right? I have to presuppose what the Verlaga is. The Verlaga of the Septuagint is the text from which the Septuagint was translated. And when I get that Verlaga, now I can compare the Verlaga with the Hebrew text and begin to make comparisons now in the readings, whether one says X or one says Y. But this Verlaga does not exist. All right? The Verlaga only exists by virtue of a retroversion as we translate the Septuagint back into, back into Hebrew, presupposing what the text was. Given what the Septuagint says, presupposing now by this retroversion what the text must have looked like. When I was at BJ uh, and I taught various doctoral classes, uh, Old Testament guys, uh, one of, I gave them an exercise from time to time. Here's the Septuagint text, and their assignment was to translate the Septuagint back into Hebrew. All right, and in so doing, they could not look at the Masoretic text. They simply had to translate that Greek text back into Hebrew. And then with that translation, we look at their Hebrew text now, and then compare it with the Masoretic text. And if I found a student whose supposed Verlaga now corresponded too closely to the Masoretic text, I became extremely suspicious. All right? I became suspicious. But that's the basis, all right? Now, to do this, I have to understand the nature of the Septuagint's translation philosophy, and it's not all the same, not all the same. And there are certainly times, there are certainly times when I compare the Septuagint with the Masoretic text that variants appear, right? That variants appear. Now, the question, the question that we have to ask ourselves in using the Septuagint in textual criticism, is whether this, the variant has its origin in the text from which the Greek was translated, or whether it has its origin in the translation process. So I, I make a distinction. This is my dissertation. All right, years ago, when I was your age, uh, I wrote my dissertation on establishing a methodology for using the uh, Septuagint in textual criticism in the Old Testament based upon an investigation of the translation philosophies and techniques. And my argument basically was that before I can make a tit-for-tat comparison, I got to know whether uh, the translation was literal, free, whatever, and here's a set of criteria for examining the translation techniques. And I, I use an expression there uh, con concerning variants. Variants that are real real variants or what I call pseudo variants. Real variants are those that actually have their origin in the text from which the Septuagint was translated. Pseudo variant is one that has its origin in the translation process. All right? And if I have a variant that's a pseudo variant, while it is a variant, it has no significance in textual criticism. If it's a real variant, now then I've got a factor I've got to factor that in. And for the critical position, very often, whenever there is any kind of an apparent variation between the Septuagint and the, uh, and the Masoretic text, they'll invariably go with the Septuagint, all right? Almost invariably. Uh, you look at the, not so much in the Stuttgart edition, but the, the Hebrew Bible that I grew up with was the Kittle edition. And in the apparatus within the Kittle edition, the number of times it was changing the text, see the set on the base of the sept. Here's the Septuagint, therefore change the Hebrew text, over and over again, changing the Masoretic text on the basis of the Septuagint evidence. So, in my dissertation, I think one of the contributions I think I was able to make is that many of these variants are really pseudo variants that have no textual foundation whatsoever. We eliminate most of those, but when there are real variants, then we have to consider it. Are there real variants? Yes, there are. Look at the New Testament. 
There are times when the New Testament quotes the uh, Old Testament where the Septuagint is different than the Masoretic text and the New Testament sides with the Septuagint. You see. Must be right. Must be right. All right, so that's the, you know, that, that's the issue. But while it is a difficult process and a very tedious process to go through this retroversion, that's the foundation by which we have to make any comparisons. But it is part of the crucial evidence because we don't have a lot of extant evidence as far as the Hebrew text is concerned. But it's complicated because the Septuagint itself goes through its own textual history. So it, what, what, in, in Septuagint studies, and I'm just kind of talking off my head here, in, in Septuagint studies, one of the biggest questions in Septuagint studies is what's the Septuagint? All right? What's the Septuagint? Because the Septuagint, I say, itself has gone through its copying process. And there are, so we have to identify, first of all, what the Septuagint is. And so in, in my dissertation, what I did, I just had to make a, a delimitation. But I'm only going to consider those places in the Septuagint that themselves are without variance. All right? And my assumption was if I have a Septuagint reading without any variance within the Septuagint evidence, I can pretty much conclude that that's the original Septuagint. And then went on from there. So you can read my dissertation if you have nothing else to do and need to sleep soundly at night. Okay. Now that's, that's, that's the Old Testament. Uh, I, I place the greatest credibility because of the tedious nature and the exponential nature or, 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 or the, what can I say here, the, the carefulness with which the Jewish scribes translated and tr tr transmitted that text, that my default text is going to be the Masoretic text. All right, my default text will be the Masoretic text. I have to acknowledge that the versional evidence sometimes factors in. There are going to be times when even in the authorized version, the authorized version exercises textual criticism. Uh, and there are going to be places where it follows a Septuagint reading versus a Masoretic text and what have you. All right, now that's the history. But when I say when we come to the evidences of textual criticism in the Old Testament, it is not nearly uh, as much of an issue as it is for the New Testament because of the nature of the evidence. The versions are more important, particularly the Septuagint. Aramaic targums will have some bearing as well, Aramaic translation, but they're interpretive. Primarily, we're looking at the Septuagint, I suppose, as the principal external evidence. I don't have patristic evidence that I'm worried about here, because it's going to be in Greek. Uh, but because of the because of the nature, because of the nature of the transmission, I think we can, with confidence hold up that Hebrew Bible, hold up that Hebrew Bible and say, here's the inspired Word of God. See? Uh, and it's the majority witness, right? In, in, in a sense, we're following the majority, although we're calling the MT here the, major, the Masoretic text, in one sense, it's the majority text as well. Uh, the, the bulk of the witnesses that God, that in God's providence, here it is again the preservation of God. We understand and we put our confidence in the providence of God, the operation of God. In his providence, this text has been preserved. And if my presupposition is correct, and I must stand upon the presupposition, inspiration demands preservation. If this be the text, then that God is preserved. See, if this be the text that God has preserved, uh, then... Uh, then I take that as very, very strong evidence. Could it be that sometimes the proper is preserved in the Septuagint? Yeah. New Testament tells me that's the case. But it's been preserved. All right? It's been preserved. And we have a mechanism in place. We have a way of evaluating that evidence to come to the, uh, to come to the proper conclusion. And, you know, we, we can look at various... You know, various examples where uh, this occurs in the Old Testament. But I, I, I think we need to, I say, for the sake of the controversy that we're concerned about here, it's principally the New Testament uh, that's going to be the matter of focus. All right, so I think we'll uh, stop then at that point. Any questions before we shut this thing off?
to respond directly to his, his work? To whose work? To it, it's basically ignored. It, it's basically been ignored. The question is, have, has anybody responded directly to Bergen? Um, there, there are going to be some that play upon some of his arguments. I'll, I'll be playing upon some of his arguments when I set up the majority uh, text. Uh, but I say for some reason, and I, I don't know all the ins and outs of what was going on in the day, but uh, for the most part not taken seriously. But uh, I think it really is a, there, there are things there that I think are unanswered. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I say I'm, I'm going to take the d question: Do I put the Masoretic text and the Septuagint on the same level of authority? They're both the Word of God, right? They're both the Word of God, uh, and so I, I want to watch out for any pejorative statements that I make about any thing that translates even you know God's Word. That's one of the things that concern me about some of the rhetoric uh, that is used, uh, even for in you know, describing. Uh, an English version that I may not be my preference or like. I want to be very careful uh, how I refer to it. Uh, but I said my default position is going to be in the Masoretic text. All right. I'm going to put my, you use that as my default uh, for various reasons. But I have to at the same time recognize, because of what the New Testament does, that there are instances when the Septuagint does preserve the original reading. You, see, you understand why I'm saying that? So here's, here's a variant between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. Here's the New Testament quoting that particular portion and it agrees with the Septuagint at that point. Well, and there's no textual variance in the New Testament at that point, so therefore there, there's my certainty that the New Testament under inspiration has put its stamp of approval upon this particular reading that's only preserved in the Septuagint. So I have to say that kind of thing does happen. Are, are you with me on that or no? Um, so if, if we find how many variants between Septuagint and Masoretic, so do we need to hold both or either one? I think every example has to be looked at independently. All right, that's why we're, we want to focus our, our decision making on the reading, all right? Not on the manuscript, but on the reading. As we come to a reading now, we'll look at the evidence on that particular, uh, in that particular instance to make then all of our, all of our conclusions. And even, and I would say that sometimes even when the New Testament does, there, there, put it this way, there are going to be times when there appears to be a variant between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text, but both are right, right? Both are right, in the sense that it's a pseudo-variant, right, it's a pseudo-variant, which means then that the, that the difference results in the translation process. And what the New Testament then tells me in those instances is that the Septuagint's interpretation of that is right. All right? So there can be a variant without actually being a textual difference. You understand what I'm saying there? And there are times in when it may be that here, here's the sanction on that interpretation that the Septuagint gives of that particular particular statement. Mm -hmm. Would you want to give an example of that? Sure. Not off of my head. Okay. I've got them written down someplace. <laughs> yeah. Okay? All right, well, we'll... Call it quits for that, and we'll start tomorrow and look at the issues of the. I put that up. Uh, the New Testament. We'll, I, I want to look at the genealogical method. Make sure you understand the reasoning there, and then compare that with where ultimately I want to go.